everybody. The No Huddle Show here from the Novacare Complex. I'm Elliot. Matt's here. And we're ready for the Arizona Cardinals. It feels like this Chargers game and the Giants game, so many storylines coming out of all of those. Cardinals come here week, uh, it's week five. Wow. That's pretty crazy to believe. And it's going to be a good one. I've actually started to change my opinion on this game a little bit as the week goes on. But we're going to break it down bit by bit, as we always do, position by position. Um, but I wanted to start this, Matt, before we got going. Yep. We'll call it Fan Friday. I want to read a review that people leave, and I appreciate everyone that's been leaving their reviews. Um, we're up to 108 now, so we're at 80 something last week. So I really appreciate everyone that's been doing it. Um, all right, Matt. So you pick one you read, you like. Nah, I'll pick. I'll pick one. Yeah, I really like the one that came from uh, Runnerish. Says it's one of the best Eagle shows around. Says really good information and analysis with a nice breakdown between Lombardo and Shore Parks. I appreciate you guys trying to get them up soon after the games. And I don't know about you, Elliot. That's one of my favorites. Is when mm-hmm. after the game from the press box, we get to be that immediate reaction for people, whether it's putting on the podcast on their way home from the stadium once it goes live, whether it's the next morning when they hop in the car, I really like the fact, and I agree with Runnerish, that you know putting them up after the game seems to be a big help for people. Yeah, although sometimes I listen to what I say after a game, after I watch it a few more times, I'm like, I wish I could have that one back. But it is <laughs> nice to uh, get that initial takeout. So the one I really liked, uh, coming from South Korea. So the title is The Quest for 100 Five-Star Reviews, and we're still trying to get up to 100 five-stars, by JLuke557. I once thought analysis by ESP was as frustrating as traffic in South Korea. ESP, you have won me over with solid and insightful points of views. Keep the podcast coming. Fly, Eagles, fly. Jason from South Korea. So that's cool. I mean, we had him from all over now. South Korea, I think we got one from Nigeria. So we appreciate everyone that's been listening. And uh, leave us a review. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, on Spreaker, Google Play. Um, you can listen to us on YouTube. If you le- if you listen to us on YouTube, leave us a like and leave us a comment there. Maybe we'll start doing YouTube comments too. But uh, I appreciate everyone that's been doing that. You know, so. that was pretty cool, Elliot, because when I first was scrolling through that review, my millisecond short minuscule attention span <laughs> thought he was cracking a joke at you about South Korea. Yeah, right. But the fact that he's actually from South Korea is pretty cool. And is. We've, we've now touched multiple continents and the No Huddle Show continues to grow. And that's why we love these five-star reviews because it helps the show bump up the rankings, helps more people find us, and, and it makes it easier for Elliot and I to get those top-notch guests to come on yeah, and exactly. talk to you guys about the Eagles. All right, well, let's get into it. So the Eagles this Sunday, Arizona Cardinals at the link. I'll, I guess we could talk big picture first, or do you want to just go position by position? Let's go big picture big because picture? I All think right. this is one of these moments in the season where we might look back over these next two games and say it might not have defined the season, but I think it's going to set the Eagles up for whatever the second half of this year holds. Yeah, I mean, look, these are games that I'm not saying if the Eagles lose that they're not going to make the playoffs. I'm not saying if they win, they definitely will. But I do think this is one of those games, like you said, where when we're you know weeks 15, 16, you're looking back at games they should of one, I think this is a game that is going to be the difference between the potentially maybe having a first round bye or maybe, you know, be fighting for a playoff spot because the the Cardinals game coming up, I think is a winnable one. You have the Panthers in prime time, which is going to be tough. Then you have the Redskins, but then I think you have the Niners, which I think should be a win for them, the Broncos. So they've gotten past the first four games in really good shape at three and one. And it's like Doug said yesterday, they're not a perfect three and one, which is a weird way to say that. But I think what he meant was he, they haven't played their best football. Um, I agree with that to a certain degree. I think they've played pretty well overall. Um, I don't think any teams have played four perfect games. No, you look around the NFL, Elliot, and and parity is at an extreme this year. There's no real dominant team that's running away either in the AFC or the NFC. There's no real discrepancy between the top tier teams and even a team like the Cleveland Browns from a talent standpoint, it seems like. And the Eagles have, have done a really nice job of evolving and growing into a team that looks like it should be in the drive seat for the NFC East when you look at winning close games, when you look at the pass rush doing its job, when you look at turnovers, when you look at some of the things that were issues a year ago or even three weeks ago, not being able to run the football. Now they have uh, 393 yards and two touchdowns Mm -hmm. over the last two weeks running the football. So I think the Eagles are evolving, and I think that that's a great place to be in today's NFL. So here, here's my thing about this game, and it's a larger picture point. You look at some of these power rankings. I saw some that had the Eagles number three. Some had them number five. Um, our buddy Mark Eckel, who's still writing a little bit, had him at number ten. I just think that's too high for this team. I think they are 
12, 13. I, I just don't think – and I can't decide if I'm being pessimistic here. But because I, I said I think they'll win the NFC East. But I think to view this team as a top five team to me is overhyping them. I mean if you look at these past two games, everyone says to me, well, the Cardinals have two wins, but they were against bad teams. Well, the Eagles last two weeks have beaten two teams that are combined 0-8 and, yep. and are terrible against the run. Yep. Now, now the, those teams' stats against the run look really bad because what the Eagles did to them, but they were bad going into that game, too. And the Cardinals can stop the run. The Cardinals and that, can stop the run. That, that's right. going to be something I'm going to be real interested to see on Sunday because Doug has talked about the reason they've become more dominant running the football is because they could run the ball against the Giants. They could run the ball against the Chargers. Are we going to see Doug stick with this balanced, run-heavy attack, or is he going to look at this matchup up and look at the the middle of that Cardinals front seven and say, you know, this is a week we need to go back to throwing the ball and we're at home and that makes it a little easier to throw the ball. I, I don't know what we're going to see on Sunday, but I do think that power rankings at this stage of the year, I don't think they're very indicative of what the year is going to look like at the end because right. I don't think we have a really strong sense of who are the legitimate contenders and who are the pretenders. But I think that still hasn't sorted but itself out. I guess what out. my point is – and. I'm not trying to make too much of this, but just being at practice this week, yesterday we're at practice, Brandon Graham, who's always one for joking around, is yelling to the reporter on the sideline, oh, you look like Bruce Arians, and we get in the locker room, um, and you know, Brandon Graham again, another player, is saying, oh, everyone pick the Chargers, everyone pick the Chargers, and then they're very light at practice. I'm not saying they're feeling themselves too much, that's not what I'm saying, but I don't think this is a top five team. I think that the last two weeks, look, I give them all the credit in the world for winning those games. I think that's what good teams do. But on the flip side, it took a 61-yarder to beat the Giants, who are 0-4, and it took a 6-minute and 44-minute drive at the end of the Chargers game to hold on to that. Had they not held on to the ball, I think the Eagles' defense was, was cooked. I think the Chargers might have been able to score. Again, they won those games. I'm not taking away from them. But I do think that this is a team that you can't – I mean, they're six-and-a-half point favorites. Me and you were talking about this in the, the uh, press box yesterday – or the press house yesterday at Novacare. This is the highest they've ever been favored under Doug. And I would have to go back and look when the last time they were even favored by six-and-a-half points. And so I'm curious to see – you know, we talked about week three, them taking the emotional test of trying to shut down a giant team that season was on the brink. Yep. Week four, traveling over to the West Coast – facing another desperate team. They passed that test. So they have passed these tests, but I think... And let's put it this way. Let's not forget, Elliot, that they won that game on Sunday without Fletcher Cox. Well, who's they, not going to play this, this Right. Either, it doesn't right? look like he's going to play this week, but Melvin Gordon is a very good running back. Phillip Rivers is still a veteran quarterback who can make teams pay, who don't get home and don't right. get sacks. They only had two sacks, and one of them was a strip fumble by Chris Long that uh, Derek Barnett recovered, and it kind of changed the tide of the game early on. But... I don't want to take anything away from the Eagles going out west and winning that game by the score that I predicted, by the way, 26-24. I don't want to take anything away from that win just because of the fact that the Chargers were playing desperate. They needed that game. Desperate teams do desperate things, and the Eagles went out, and they t- took care of business, and they got right, the job I, done. I guess, and I'm not taking anything away from it either, but I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is I don't think they're a dominant 3-1. and one. I don't think they're a team where – you can look at the Cardinals and go, okay, they're definitely going to beat the Cardinals. And everyone talked about last week's game as a letdown. I feel like this week's game might be a letdown. And I had someone tweet, I had someone tweet at me today, and I didn't have a chance to check it, but I'll just take this guy's word for it. Maybe dangerous, but teams this season going into Thursday night are zero and six this year. So I just thought that was pretty pretty telling about you know the the struggle of knowing you have a game coming up on Thursday. You're playing a team in the Cardinals that you traditionally struggle against. Yep. So we'll get in. Let's we'll get into position by position. But, just but I don't. Off I don't, the bat, yeah, I yeah. have a bad feeling about this game. Yeah, I, I don't share that bad feeling, Elliot. And you and I have talked about this. I think that all of the intangible arguments that you're making about you know looking ahead to Thursday night, coming back from a West Coast trip, having they had that quote unquote signature win over a dominant team. Yet I think all of those things make sense. Throw in not having Fletcher Cox again this week uh, against a team that can't run the ball, but still has a veteran quarterback where a pass rush up the middle would help. All of those things make sense, but I just don't see the Cardinals having the horses, and we'll get into the position by position, uh, to pull it off. I, I think that outside of Larry Fitzgerald and Carson Palmer, they don't have an offensive line. Their defense can stop the run, but they're really vulnerable against the pass. 
I, I just don't think this is the week where the Eagles stumble. But I will say this, you need to split these next two games. And, and I, it, the bad feeling you have today about the Arizona game on Sunday, I feel worse about the Carolina game. Well, I looking think the Panthers what, are a better team. Though. Right, looking at right. Carolina and what Cam Newton did last week going up to New England, looking at Christian McCaffrey playing like a top-tier running back and one of the leading uh, receivers as a running back in the NFL right now. I think the Eagles have a chance to get blown out next Thursday. And if you go 0 and 2 in these two games, and you go from starting 3 and 1 to 3 and 3 after six weeks, that that is that that, that is not where you want to be if you want to well, consider yourself a contender in the see, NFC that, East. That's kind of my thing. So ultimately, I ended up picking them to win the NFC East, and I think we were both we probably both probably had the same outlook on this team heading into the season. I've become much more bullish on them over the three and one start than I was before the well, year. Well, I guess my, my point is though, I don't think any either of us think they're winning twelve games. They're no. not winning eleven games. So they're I mean they're not gonna you know. They're not going to beat the Cardinals and then go beat the Panthers and then go, you know, maybe they will. Who knows? But I just think this team, look, like, they, they're due for a clunker, I guess is what I'm saying. Even in training camp, I thought they were extremely inconsistent. Last season, obviously, they lost the nine in a row. I thought they were inconsistent last year. Winning three out of four is hard to do. I just feel like they're due for a clunker. So let, let, let's get into it. Yep. Um, and the other thing I was going to say was you talked about intangibles. I remember uh, at practice on Wednesday, me, you, I think it was me, you, Zach Berman, Jimmy Kemsky, and I think I forget it was maybe another right, Teron Davenport. We're all standing there, and Zach was saying how I was only looking at this game from an intangible standpoint. And I thought that was a good point. And Zach was, Zach was saying from the X's and O's, he thinks it favors the Cardinals. But when I really took a deep dive into the X's and O's, I think this Cardinals team does present some matchups or problems for the Eagles, just short of the intangible. So let's start about one that I think could be an issue for the Eagles, and we'll talk about the Eagles cornerbacks versus the Cardinals receivers. Um, that look, might be the one area where Arizona has the edge. Well, I, okay, I think they have the edge in a couple areas, but okay. we'll, we'll, we'll start there. So obviously, you know, John Brown on the outside, J.J. Nelson, uh, Jaron Brown, those are just their outside receivers. All of them, when I looked it up, all of them ran a 4-3 or, or – uh, Four three or faster in the forty yard dash coming out of college. Now you know college was a few years ago for these guys, but my point is they have speed on the outside. And one thing you were right about that I underestimated against the Chargers was the speed of the the Chargers receivers was a real issue for these Eagles cornerbacks. Jaron Brown and John Brown are both as fast or faster than Terrell Williams right. and, Ken- and both Keenan, Keenan Allen. Keenan Allen and Terrell Williams both topped hundred yards last week. Yep, um, and each had a catch over fifty yards. Now. The Cardinals haven't had as much success getting the ball deep because their offensive line has been such a problem. But if you're just talking about that matchup, if the Eagles start with Sewell Douglas on the outside and Jalen Mills, as I'm assuming they will. Now, Jalen Watkins might play this week. So I would be surprised if they bench uh, Rasul Douglas for Jalen Watkins. But that is. Something. But I think he'll be part of the rotation. I think that they'll yeah. rotate the corners a and little Watkins bit more. Watkins is faster, but he's not right. fast. Like, he doesn't have elite speed. No, but I think that he might be a better matchup against uh, Jaron Brown than Rasul Douglas is. And right. I think that it's going to be real interesting to see what happens with that Larry Fitzgerald matchup. Patrick Robinson's probably going to draw him most of the game. The, the Eagles have traditionally dropped Malcolm Jenkins from safety down into the slot against him. I don't know that you feel comfortable doing that with so much speed at the two outside spots, and that's a matchup where Carson Palmer might be able to drop back and have a little bit of a feeding frenzy over the middle of the field if Malcolm Jenkins isn't playing center field in deep coverage. But I, I just think the Eagles' pass rush, Elliot, against this offensive line is, is going to kind of level the playing field, so to speak, and neutralize some of that speed. All right. Well, yeah, we'll get into that in a second. But so I think it was Wednesday. Um, I recorded a video when we, we and we were talking about it, just saying I thought the Eagles were well equipped to cover Larry Fitzgerald. The more I think about that, I'm not as sure because Patrick Robinson has been very good this year as a nickel corner. There's no denying that he's probably been their best cornerback overall. But his game is speed. And I'm not sure how he'll do against a bigger Fitzgerald. I mean, Fitzgerald's six three. I mean, obviously a great receiver. You don't have to get yep. into how good he is. But yep. He's a physical guy. So that makes me think maybe they'll drop Malcolm Jenkins down into the slot, but Jenkins or to the nickel. But Jenkins hasn't been that good up on the line covering receivers. I mean, he's done good against the tight ends, but he hasn't done that good against receivers. Last year, 2016, he was not good. He let up six touchdowns as a nickel cornerback. Now he's played it less this year, but he's been average this year too. So, and then you know, so then you take Patrick Robinson off the field. Maybe you move Patrick Robinson to the outside, but that's not something I think they're going to end up doing. So. I think the Fitzgerald thing is going to be a matchup problem, and as we know, Fitzgerald always kill always kills the Eagles. Yep. Um, in eight career games against him, he has 50 catches for 845 yards and 11 touchdowns. So he's averaging more than a touchdown per game. He's averaging over 100 yards a game. 
Now, maybe this year they shut him down. Who knows? But I think the, the Cardinals have a serious advantage at, at receiver and in the passing game over the Eagles. Do you want to hear a bold prediction here, Elliot? I know you love the fire. Yeah, you love the hashtag, hashtag fire hashtag. emoji. You hashtag it. All right, let's go. I think Larry Fitzgerald could have two touchdowns and the Cardinals still lose the game. I, I think that the Cardinals are just so deficient at running back, at, at uh, offensive line, and the Eagles getting to Carson Palmer that even if Larry Fitzgerald gets his, I don't know that there's enough there to beat the Eagles. And and again, you know, anything can happen, but I think that Larry Fitzgerald could get two touchdowns and Arizona still lose. All right, so let's talk about the pass rush. Yep. So I think we both agree the Eagles, just purely the, the Cardinals receivers versus the Eagles secondary, we're giving that advantage to the Correct. Cardinals. Correct, okay. yep. So let's talk about the, sec- the uh, offensive line. So the Cardinals offensive line, not good. I think they've given up 17 or 18 sacks, which is the most in the NFL. Pro Football Focus has them giving up more than any more pressures than any other offensive line, so their offensive line is not good. But here's my concern: before the Giants game, we talked about how the offensive line, the Eagles' defensive line, had to dominate, and I think they played well. But they didn't sack Eli Manning one time. They sacked Philip Rivers last week twice, but so the past two weeks they faced two bad offensive lines and they've totaled two sacks. Now I understand sacks are not the end all be of all of a pass rush, but my point is this: the week before the Giants played the Eagles, the Detroit Lions sacked Eli Manning at least three times. I think it was maybe even three or four. The Eagles didn't bring them down at all. And now that we're four games into the season, and you look at a larger picture of the Eagles' defensive line, I think they've played well. But Brandon Graham's the only one the pro football focus has in the top 20 in quarterback pressures. Yep. Between the four defensive ends, I'm sorry, between Vinnie Curry, Derek Barnett, and Chris Long, they only have two sacks, and they're both from Chris Long. So Vinnie Curry, I think, has been a little disappointing. Derek Barnett, again, you grade him as a rookie, so... I think he's shown signs, but I don't think either me or you would sit here and say he's gotten consistent pressure on the quarterback. I think he's played well. He's played and I well, think, but I, I think, think he's... for a rookie four games into his career, he's played well. I right. don't think as a you know a dominant. He's nowhere near a dominant. Right. I mean, threat. he played 42 snaps on Sunday. I believe Vinny Curry played 61 percent of the snaps on Sunday, but he's inching up there in terms of playing time. And he had the fumble recovery. And if you just watch him on tape, he's winning a lot of those matchups. And he might not be getting credited for hurries, but I think that his presence on the outside has kind of forced the quarterback into the arms of a Brandon Graham or into that pressure mm-hmm. up the middle. But uh, again, it's four games into his career. I don't think we expect him to be Reggie White. And no. I think that he's done his job, and I think he's going to continue to get better. But, but, but I guess my point of making is this. Through four games, have the defensive ends played up to your expectations? Statistically, I'd say... Not even just statistically, like in general. You know, I think in a lot of ways they have, because when you watch on tape, I see a lot of times where the pocket gets collapsed, and it's Jernigan, or it's Cox, or it's Bo Allen, who winds up getting the sack, or forcing you know, a, a hurry because the quarterback has the pocket collapsing from the outside. So I was going to say, if I were grading the defense events at this point, Elliot, I'd probably give them around a B to a B plus. Yeah, so I think they've played well. I think the expectations were really high. So, I mean, I don't think they've lived up to expectations. But my point is, everyone's saying, you know, well, they the Cardinals' offensive line is bad. The Eagles will dominate. And the Eagles did win the last two weeks. But I don't think I've seen the Eagles' defensive line that's dominated the past two weeks. I think you can make the argument they've gotten pressure. But I don't think the reason the Eagles won the game last two weeks was because of their defensive line. So, although the Cardinals' offensive line is bad... I can't sit here and say that the Eagles' defensive line is going to win them this game because I haven't seen them do it. And so now we talk about the defensive tackles. Fletcher Cox isn't going to play. Timmy Jernigan has missed some practice time this week. Yep. No Eagles player this season so far. And I know it's only four games, but no Eagles player this this season has missed practice on Wednesday and played on Sunday. So, I mean, Jernigan at the very least I think is going to be a little bit banged up. So you're going to be without Cox, prob- maybe without Jernigan. Bo Allen played well, but I just don't think this Eagles defensive line, we can go into it. I give them the advantage. Over I, the I, I think I think you are overestimating the Cardinals offensive line. But the Giants offensive line coming into that game, we all said was terrible. Right, but Eli gets rid of the football much quicker than Carson then, Palmer well, does. Well, but that, that was a game plan by the Giants. I mean, Eli gets rid of the ball quick, but he yeah. had a game plan to do that. Right, and I, I don't think that Palmer has that in him is what is what I'm saying. And I also think that... This offensive line is really bad. Seven, 17 sacks yeah. through the first four but games. the Giants offensive line was really bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that they right. aren't. I'm just saying that Eli gets rid of the football quicker, and I think that this, as bad as the Giants offensive line was, I think the Cardinals offensive line is much worse. Right, but I get, so I guess my larger point is 
the people I've talked to, just you know, reporters and friends and all that, says, oh well, the Eagles are going to win. Their dof- their Gi- Cardinals offensive line is terrible. I don't think the Eagles defensive line is at a point where I can pick them to win a game solely because of that. I need to see other areas of the field where I think the Eagles have the advantage because I don't think Curry, Barnett, or Chris Long, or really Graham, have been consistent enough this season where I'm sure that they're going to dominate without Fletcher Cox in there. So even though we disagree slightly on the, on the how much of an advantage it is, I do think we both give the Eagles the advantage yep. defensive line over yep. the Cardinals offensive line. Um, all right, so we talked about the segment. We talked about the defensive line. Here's an interesting one, um, I think. So you t- you touched on a little bit at the end, at the beginning. The Cardinals are good against the run. So let's talk about the Eagles offensive line versus the Cardinals defensive line. Now, the past two weeks, the Eagles have run the ball really well because they faced two bad run defensive. Th- this year, the Cardinals are giving it up. I have it right here. 80 yards per game. 80 yards yep. per game, but only 3.2 yards per run this season, which yep. is six in the NFL. So they're, they, they're doing a great job against the run. I'll be interested to see how much Doug Peterson runs the ball, how much he sticks with it. If he, if it's not working, and he doesn't stick with it. I, I can't kill him for it, but I'll just be interested to see if they're I'm just interested to see if they're able to run the ball against Cardinals. Yeah, I think the Eagles' offensive line has played significantly better over the last two weeks, which is kind of saying something, particularly because they've been rotating left guards with Stefan Wisniewski and Chance Warmack, and you made Isaac Sayamalo inactive against the Chargers last week. So I'm really surprised at how well the offensive line is playing. But like I touched on at the beginning of the show, and as you just brought up, Elliot, the Cardinals are really good at stopping the run. If there's one strength of that defense, mm-hmm. that would be it. So I'll be really interested to see what the run pass ratio winds up being on Sunday afternoon and I wouldn't be shocked if we see them pass the ball more than they run it but I don't think it's going to be so out of whack where like we saw against Kansas City Carson Wentz dropped back 56 times I think yeah. it, if anything it'll be a 55-45 split I, I don't think that it's going to be a, a dominated pass heavy offensive game plan but I really don't think we're going to see the extreme of that 50-50 and they run the ball for 200 yards if they combine for 125 rushing yards and Carson Wentz throws the ball you know 37 times I think that's kind of the sweet spot if yeah, they can, they can pull get that over off. 100 yards I think they win the game yep. I'll say that if they get over 100 yards but just from a pass rush perspective you know we just talked about well you said it and I said it to a certain degree how good the Eagles pass rush is Cardinals only have Excuse me. The Cardinals only have one less sack this year. The Cardinals have nine sacks this year, and the Eagles have ten. So the Cardinals' pass rush might not be as good as the Eagles, but statistically, they haven't been that. I mean, they've been pretty similar. So I'm going to give the advantage to the Eagles' offensive line. I think just because they've played better, um, they've run the ball well. But I think this one is about as close to a toss-up as as we've had in any matchup this year in any of the first four games. So I'll slightly give it to the Eagles, but I think it's a, it's a 50, 50 split there on that one. Got gotcha. you. I, you know, I, I think that the Eagles have an advantage over that front seven. Okay. So you're going with the Eagles. Yep. There. All right. So the next one we'll talk about, and these to me are two of the main reasons I think this is going to be a tough game for the Eagles. First, let's talk about the Cardinal secondary versus the, uh, Eagles receivers, and obviously that starts with Patrick Peterson. So Patrick Peterson this year has shadowed the other team's best receiver in all four games. So he's covered Detroit Lions, Marvin Jones, Indianapolis Colts, T.Y. Hilton, yep. Des Bryant for the Dallas Cowboys, who you think is the best receiver in the league. Huh. <laughs> and, and let's clear that up. That was kind of a, a how do I put this, a flippant comment. Right. I don't I, think you I, thought I, it out. No, I, I did, it was one of those spur of the moment, you know, just breaking your stones a little right. bit sitting here at NovaCare. Obviously, Antonio Brown is a better receiver. Obviously, you can make a case for uh, Julio Jones being a better receiver. I think Des Bryant is certainly a top five receiver in this league, but I've taken some heat on Twitter saying Des was the, was the best. It was kind of a flipping right. spur of the moment comment. That's all. Well, regardless, he's covered some good receivers. Yep. So Marvin Jones, T.Y. Hilton, Des Bryant, and then Pierre Garçon with the Niners. So you can make the argument if those how many of those receivers are better than Alshon, but those four guys have combined this year against Patrick Peterson according to Pro Football Focus, for four catches, 38 yards, and no touchdowns. So not not without – to. I don't want to get in a big Alshon debate. Sure. But I think you can say pretty safely, or at least I'm willing to say it, Alshon is not going to be a factor in this game because he's not played well against number one cornerbacks this year, hasn't been that good overall, and now you have the best cornerback in the league maybe going against him, and they're going to put him on – he's going to be on Alshon for 80 85% of the snaps. Yep. So I don't think – I think – 
Alshon Jeffrey is going to be completely taken out of this game. The Eagles need a big game from Torrey Smith. And, there, and, and so therein lies the problem. Right, and Torrey's talked about this this week, and, and i got to give him credit. He stood at his locker, and he faced the music, and he answered every question about the drop passes, about missed opportunities, about his struggles. But I think the impact that Alshon Jeffrey has on this game is going to be the fact that Patrick Peterson isn't covering Nelson Aguilar, that he isn't covering Torrey Smith. And and I think it is a problem, as you said, that the Eagles need to rely on Torrey Smith because he's had opportunities where he's broken open and he's dropped catchable balls. He's dropped every 50-50 ball thrown his way. He's probably the best deep threat on this offense, and Carson Wentz hasn't been able to connect with him because he's dropped those passes. So this is the week you need to to see Torrey Smith break out, or maybe you start thinking about throwing Mac Hollins in there for some snaps, but I- I'm with you. I-, I don't see Alshon Jeffrey accounting for more than 50 to 70 yards, and I think it's going to once again be the Nelson Aguilar, Zach Ertz uh, show well, through the passing game. All right, so therein lies the Eagles' next problem, in my opinion, which is that the Cardinals are very good covering tight ends. Yep. So last year, uh, in 2016, they allowed the second – Fewest catches to tight ends in the NFL. They only allowed 418 yards all season, which was second fewest to tight ends. And they only gave up two touchdowns all year to tight ends. Now, that's continued this year. This year, in the four games they've played, tight ends are averaging three and a half catches and 36 yards against them. And they haven't scored a touchdown. So, we can agree that the Eagles have been able to win without Alshon playing that well. Because they've really been able to rely on Zach Ertz and to a certain degree Nelson Aguilar, but mostly Zach Ertz. I mean, Zach Ertz has really been the reason this passing game is working, in my opinion. If they had Brent Selleck at tight end, I think they would be in a lot of trouble. But Ertz has played really well. Now, Ertz is a top five tight end, so he should be able to still do, you know, to get the ball against the Cardinals. But my point is this. If the Cardinals take away Zach Ertz, if Zach Ertz only finishes with four catches, 36 yards, and no touchdowns, I will guarantee you the Eagles do not win this game because they do not have the pa- – the- Torrey Smith and Nelson Aguilar are not going to carry this team to a win. You need Zach Ertz or you need the running game. Yep. And the Cardinals are good against the run. Yep. They're good against tight ends. Yep. And they're going to take away Alshon. Yep. So if you're looking at that and you're saying, can I rely on Nelson Aguilar and Torrey Smith, I think this is – a, a real issue for the Eagles. Well, I think you can rely on Nelson Aguilar. I mean, he's averaging a team-best 14.4 yards per catch. He has as many touchdowns as Alshon Jeffrey does, which is a team-leading two, right. which is kind of crazy to think that after five games, your two leading receivers four are games. tied for four, four games, games, rather, are tied for two touchdowns. So right. uh, that's kind of interesting, the way they spread the football around. But again, uh, you know, do they need to score 30 points to win this game? I, I don't think they do. Do they need to score between 20 and 24? Yeah, I would say so, especially if I'm already making and a case that... we know they're that... probably going to get 20 points. I mean, they've scored right. more 20-point games than, any other, than I think only the Packers and... Uh... The Falcons. Patriots and pa- – yeah, yeah, exactly, have more. So we know they're probably going to get at least yep. 20 points. So, so you know, can you spread that around and Torrey Smith finally catches a touchdown and Nelson Aguilar catches his third touchdown and Jake Elliott kicks a couple field goals? I think that's possible. But I, I, I hear what you're saying about Alshon versus Patrick Peterson. I hear the ability that the Cardinals have to take away Zach Ertz. But that doesn't mean that those guys are going to count for zero catches for zero yards and zero touchdowns. No, it doesn't. But I'm just saying the Eagles passing game over the last three weeks, really, or really just all this season, if I were to say the reason they've, they're they 3-1, and one, one, the running game. Now, yep. they've, paid, they've played bad running teams, but regardless, the running game. And I think on other part of offense is Zach Ertz. And I think those two areas are going to be – it's going to be tough to get them going Agreed. against Agreed. the Cardinals. And so I think that's why when you know I see the Eagles favored by six and a half points. I see everyone saying – I mean, I think almost all the other writers when we talked yesterday, I was like, nah, the Eagles are going to win. You're, everyone's focusing so much on this the Cardinals offensive line. This Cardinals team presents other problems besides the fact that the Eagles pass rush might have a good day. So I see the Eagles struggling on offense. And as well as I think Carson Wentz has played, and I do think he's played very well – He's still a second-year guy, only played 20 years in the league. I think, you know, maybe he's due for a clunker. I just – I think this, this this game has some serious issues. So let's – all right, so the Eagles secondary – I'm sorry, the Eagles receivers, including Zachers, versus the Cardinals secondary. Who do you give the edge to there? I, you know, I think it's a push. I really think it's a push because Patrick okay. Peterson is dominant. The Cardinals are dominant against the tight ends. I don't really give much of an advantage there because the Eagles haven't, outside of Nelson Aguilar, developed that 
legitimate third weapon. So it sounds like you you're saying Cardinals. Based off oh, everything. I'm saying push. I'm saying I'm saying it's about even. Right, but everything you're saying sounds like you want to lean. Cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm saying it's. I'm saying yeah. I'm saying if if you know it's it's advantage advantage or push, I give it a push. I don't All think right. that I don't think I think this is a matchup that's that's very even between both teams. So I'm going to lean Cardinals on that one, just because the Eagles' best receiver, Alshon Jeffrey, I don't think he wins his matchup versus Patrick Peterson, and they're and they're good against tight end. So I'm going to give the advantage to Cardinals on that one. So. Sounds like I mean I'm I've leaned Cardinals a little more than you have, but all right, it's time to make the pick. Yep. So the over, the line is six and a half. Do we? I'm the, I'm at very least not picking the Eagles to cover. What about you? No, I'm not picking them to cover either. Right, so I think, think it's going to be much closer. Close game. All right. Uh, over under is forty five and a half. Okay. So what's your what's your pick? Eagles Cardinals. Who's going to win? And give us a score. Uh, I think the Eagles win this game. I think that it's it's a team that's playing with a lot of confidence right now. It's an offense that continues to develop some balance. I don't think they cover the game. I, I like them uh, twenty four to twenty. All right. So I've been literally debating about this. Probably you probably are still debating <laughs> it in your I'm head still right now. now. So follow yeah. me on Twitter, and you'll see my official pick before the game. But I'm picking the Cardinals. My gut tells me I should pick the Cardinals. I'm 15 and five picking the Eagles over the last since Doug got hired, and I just this feels like a loss to me. It feels like a letdown game. I don't know. May, I think maybe I'll pick them against the Panthers, but this just feels like a letdown game to me. I think the Cardinals present some serious problems. One o'clock game. I just it just feels like this is it's a letdown to me, and I think there's enough X's and O's there. So I'm gonna pick the Cardinals 24 to 21. That's my my official prediction as of today. But before Sunday, check me out. Maybe I'll have a different one. So at the very least, I think we can both agree this is going to be a close game. I, I agree. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo PHL. I have, a lot, I, have, the same. I, I have a lot of ground to make up on you. You have like 30,000 more followers than I do. So five-star reviews. Yeah. Follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo PHL. And my pick will be the same. It'll be 24-20. Stick with me, though, because last week I had Birds 26, Chargers 24. You ended up picking the Eagles, I mean, the Eagles last week? I did. Tw- I, and I nailed the final score. Boom. Bang! Boom. There you go. All right. Well, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> we got an Eagles win coming up then. But win or lose, we will have a podcast for you after the game on Sunday. Um, and during the game, tweet us your takes on it. So tweet us, hashtag the No Huddle Show, or email us at the No Huddle Show at njadvancemedia.com. And we'll uh, read your takes along with Joe Giglio on Tuesday's podcast. And once again, we're going to be doing this Fan Friday. We'll be reading a review. So leave us your review. If it's good, if it's fire, we will, we will read it on the podcast. Leave us those five-star reviews. I really appreciate it. Matt, talk to you soon. Looking forward to it.